Welcome, welcome. It's the Jill on Money Show. It is Friday, October 14th, and we are here answering your questions about anything remotely financial. If that's you, if something's keeping you up at night, maybe something is bugging you, maybe it's a question you think you're sort of embarrassed to ask anybody else, don't be embarrassed. We are here for you. Just go to the website, jillonmoney.com, jillonmoney.com, and uh, click the Contact Us button. It's all right there for you on the front door. All of our content is right on that website. So if you want to dive in and check out some stuff that we've been writing or other um, shows that we've got or videos, TV appearances, all right there. Okay, this person's name is called, you ready? Brick by Brick. And the question is, increase insurance to pay off multiple properties? Hmm. And Jill and Uncle Mark. Aloha. I'm working on updating my will. My life circumstances have changed. I misplaced my first one, which is like the cringy thing. Okay. I bet that that's not the truth. Okay. I have a $400,000 policy. I think life insurance policy through work. I don't have any dependents. I do have three properties and a tad bit of money in investments. Depending on the interest rates and market, I'll likely purchase another property in one to four years. I plan to distribute my investments between my siblings and my parents. Should I purchase additional life insurance that would cover the outstanding mortgages so that my family can pay them off in full? No, I'm going to, he gives me all the information. Okay. With the outstanding mortgage rates and this, absolutely not. This is unnecessary. You might leave them all these properties and they don't want the properties. How about that? You, there's no reason to do this. Do not buy the insurance. They will in, they will inherit an asset and they will determine whether or not they want to keep that asset. If they don't want to keep the asset, then they sell it. And then it didn't matter to have the insurance. And, and if they're going to keep the investment in the property, that's okay too. But I say no, absolutely not necessary. Again, it may be that in the future, if you were to get married or someone else is depending on you, sure. But this is just unnecessary. You need to like passing money over to an insurance company. Well, I'm not into this. Okay. Richard writes that uh, he says, I have a 401k and a Roth with Fidelity. And I'm thinking of switching to Edward Jones. Hmm. Okay. Fidelity has been managing my account since March of 2022. I started with 523 grand. I'm now down to 410. All the funds they have me and have lost big time. Most of the funds I've never heard of does Fidelity, do Fidelity managers get paid kickbacks from these funds? No. Um, okay. So here's the thing. If, if you had told the person at Fidelity that you wanted to have an aggressive account or even just a growth account, you lost money just because of the timing of this. It sounds like someone at Edward Jones would be managing money for you, which would cost you more money. I'm worried that you're going to just get into another situation where someone's going to manage your money. You're going to pay a fee for that. And, you know, really, it may not be necessary. Now, if you do want to talk to somebody at Edward Jones and you do want to pay them, uh, make sure you know how you're paying them. Is it a commission? Is it a flat fee? Is it an ongoing fee based on the money that you're invested? Just remember that even if you're age 71, um, you don't need all of your money at once and you may want to really consider what it is that you're hoping to do with this money. All right. Sharon writes, I'm 78 and I have an IRA and it's losing money every day. Hmm. Now, I don't need the money at the moment, but I will in the next several months. Oh, wait. If you need money within the next 12 months, you cannot have it at risk. Okay. Really? So she says that she has... It says subject, it's an IRA. And she says, I don't have a large portfolio. If I bail now, I have to pay taxes on it. What do you mean you have to pay taxes on it? You don't have to pay taxes on it. You can get out of the investments and you will take a beating just on the investments, but you don't have to pull the money out of the portfolio, do you? I don't know how much money you need to pull from the portfolio, but all these questions have the exact same ring of, of, of uh, familiarity to me, which is, you guys all were investing, had too much money at risk, and you didn't realize that you were going to need your money. But before you start pulling the trigger and selling stuff, I need to know more. Okay. Uh, Nancy wants to know whether or not long-term care insurance is worth it. And if so, who is it best for? You know, it can be worth it, but it's so expensive. So 
the way I think about long-term care insurance is it is really important to say who's at risk. So who is the highest risk? Uh, let's say you're a partnered couple, you're married or you have a partner, right? And like Mark and I, are, let's use me and Mark, we're an example, pretend we're married. You know, we're in our 60s or so, and we have um, a net worth, let's call it at, you know, outside of the house, maybe we have a million dollars net worth outside of our house. Now, if one of us were to become infirmed and would need care, we would have to have the money, that million dollars, go out and pay for the care that is needed. Now, the interesting thing is that even though long-term care illnesses don't usually last, you know, for decades, but you could see where, you know, in a decent um, amount of money being spent, at least on somebody coming into the home or maybe in a facility, you could start plowing through money pretty quickly. Maybe a hundred grand a year if you were in a facility. That would be actually kind of affordable in many places. So what does that do? The person who is left, the survivor, has a reduced nest egg. That person is left with some bad decisions to make. So often I think of the idea of long-term care as more suited for people who are coupled and people who have a, a good amount of savings, but not, um, you know, not more than, say, $2 million, a million and a half maybe. If you fall in that category, you sort of say, well, I have, let's say, I have that much money. Maybe you want to buy some long-term care insurance, but it's really expensive. The problem is that the people who need that kind of coverage can't afford to pay as much as it will cost them. But you could get a long-term care policy that is partially covering some future need. So, you know, if you're single and you're listening to this, you say, well, I have long-term care. Do I not need it? it? It's really about who suffers if you blow through all of your money. So if you're single, you, you basically spend all your money down and you don't have any more money after you ha go through an illness, you're not leaving a spouse. Maybe you don't leave the kids as much money. That's your downside there. Now, if you don't have a lot of assets, let's say you have a $300,000 house and $200,000 in savings. Those people, you know, you spend your assets down to certain levels and then the government will cover you. So you'll qualify for Medicaid. You may not like the facility that Medicaid gives you, but it is there. So that's one of the, um, that's kind of the benefit of having less money. But, you know, it's a very hard issue. So if you have more questions, give us a holler back and we'll bring you on the air and we'll talk about this. Okay. This now, this question is Anne and she says, the subject, who is right? Hi, Jill and Mark. Thanks for all you do. I listen to you every morning. Okay. Hoping you can weigh in on two questions. First, who's right about whether I'm on track for retirement? My fee-based financial advisor or my Schwab CFP provided free by my work? Okay. Second, to Roth or not to Roth. Okay, let's go for the background. 50 years old, single, solo mom, teenage kid. There isn't another parent or family member in the picture. So I'm the sole financial provider for me and my child. Okay. Now that my child is a teenager, I've taken a lot more work on, resulting in a much higher income in the past few years. But it comes at a cost. I'm so stressed out and burnt out. Oh. What I'd like to do is keep working at my current income pace for the next three to five years. Then step back to more reasonable hours for another, say, five to six years. Would probably make more like $200,000 per year with the same retirement benefits. Hmm. Okay. Then around at age 60 to 62, stop working as a W-2 worker, but still bring in income as a contractor, maybe seventy-five dollars to $100,000 per year. Okay. Fee-based advisor says I'm doing okay. It'll work out on track. CFP from Schwab says I'm not on track. I would need to keep working at my current pace for another 10 to 12 years. Well, wait a second. So she gave, she makes a $320,000 base, a hundred thirty grand bonus each year. She also receives some profit sharing 401k. She's got 735 grand in 401k. Um, some money in a cash balance plan, 16,000 in a Roth, which is a back, she does backdoor, 10 grand in I bonds, 30 grand in an emergency fund, 200 grand in land, which is undeveloped, $920,000 home with a $320,000 mortgage at, you ready for this, 2.875%, $75,000 uh, home equity line of credit, 
currently um, at 4.9%. No other debt than the mortgage and the HELOC. I plan to pay off the HELOC with the bonus this year. Okay, so that'll be done. No 529 or other college savings. I max out my 401k each year and make catch-up contributions to a backdoor Roth. So she spends, here we go, 13 to 14 grand a month. This is interesting because she kind of knows herself. I love this. She says, this high cost of living, 13 to 14 grand a month, is um, a mix of raising a child in a high cost of living area and spending a lot of money for help. Tutors, drivers, housekeeper, dog walker, things I wouldn't do if I weren't working uh, so hard and stress spending. She's so funny. I think once my kid is launched, I'll probably be able to spend ten or twelve thousand dollars a month and be more than fine. I could probably get to around eight to nine and also be fine. It would involve cutting down on spending like eating out or vacations. Okay. Social security, you're not gonna take it at sixty two, is thirty one hundred dollars, thirty two hundred dollars a month. And she said she'd actually like to wait till Social Security at seventy four grand, it would be. Okay, here's her X factor. I have an aging parent who may need help and my kid isn't launched yet. I think parent may need about $1,000 per month from me at some point in the next two to three years, maybe a little more. Kid is probably college bound. I'm focused on community college for the first two years, then transfer to a four-year school. I plan to cash flow college from my income. I expect the kid uh, might be a bit slow to launch, so may need to help, may need help from me financially. Fee-based CFP says, stick to the plan, I'll be okay. When I model it out, it seems that I'll have about two to two and a half million dollars in retirement at around age 65, and then wait as long as possible to take social security, live off consulting income as much as possible. Schwab CFP says, it doesn't work. I'll need three and a half to four and a half to be able to retire. I feel like the answer lies in the middle and comes down to what I will spend in retirement, which is a little hard to estimate right now. Finally, Fee-based planner says, don't do a Roth given income level right now. I feel like I should do a Roth or at least some Roth. So I've, so I've been putting my catch up in Roth. Should I be all Roth? I know Mark will say all Roth, but I'd love to hear it with my own ears. I know it's a lot of info. Would love to make it on the show and hear your thoughts. I know how amazingly fortunate I am to have this income right now, but it comes at a steep cost. I feel like I've given my everything to my job and my child. I'm hoping there's a way to carve out some space and time for me before I'm in my 70s. I can't imagine grinding this way for the next 20 years. Well, okay. I think you're right. I think something lies in between. They're they're clearly working off of two different assumptions. So I'm wondering if the Schwab person is assuming that you're not going to be able to push down your spending, that maybe you're, the Schwab person is saying 14 grand a year. I mean, sorry, 14 grand a month, and that's going to be forever, and you're going to need to do that. I want to look at it in a more reasonable way. Forget about the numbers at this point for one second. If you're so fried that you can't do whatever it is you're doing right now for a longer time, then don't do it. So what I think is reasonable is to kind of keep stress testing the plan every three years. You put three more years in right now and then revisit the numbers, okay? And then you'll know more information. And then in another three years, you can say, you know, maybe you can pull back at that time. And maybe you can, maybe it's not gonna be five to six more years. Maybe it's really more like for three or four or five years, it's, maybe it's three years at your current pace. And then maybe it's gonna be eight years, at the next level. And maybe the the reality is that you would be able to continue to be um, working for a longer period of time as a freelancer, but you're going to have to kind of see where you land. You're going to have to see what the real needs are with the aging parent. You're going to have to see what the kid is going to do. But what you really need to do is give yourself a break. If you cannot do this at your current pace for the next, uh, beyond another three, four or five years, then that's your plan. You're going to step back. Then you see how it works. That's it. And you can always change your mind. You can always blow out that undeveloped land. You can always decide that once the kid is launched, you're going to say, I'm done with this big house. I've got a lot of equity in it. Give yourself some outs. That's what I would say. Mark's going to say he wants you to do some uh, Roth. I wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, I don't know exactly where you live, what state you live in, but you know, you're right now making $450,000 a year as a single person. $450,000 as a single person puts you in the 35% tax bracket. So, yeah, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do a Roth. Mark will tell you that he wants you to do some Roth. 
So I think you give yourself uh, give yourself some kindness, my friend. You don't need to be on a plan forever. You can do this for three more years and then let's see. If you feel like you want to make those choices and you're willing to make some spending cutbacks, then that's it. That's your answer. You will be able to make this work. You've got a ton of income. You've got a lot of choices. Don't get yourself so caught up in the numbers. It's not your destiny. You know, you, you've got some choices and you'll see how you feel as you go forward. But give yourself a little bit of kindness, girl. Okay. Can you do that? That would be so good. Okay. I think that's it. That's the program. Oh my gosh, it's the end of the program and it's Friday and you know I do business on Friday. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We are distributed by Cadence 13. Please leave us a rating and review on Apple if you would not mind. And when you're on the website, take the poll. I want that poll. We need a lot more people to answer the poll question and pre-order the new book. It would be so good. So the book is called The Great Money Reset We want you to learn how to turn chaos into opportunity. See, this is a good book for the last question. You know, you're going to be able to change your life, but you're going to have to use your money to make the changes you need to make. Okay? Do something nice for someone else today. Grit, growth, grace. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.